Welcome to the Sud Snacks and Socialism Forum for Saturday, November 7th. Our title is Proud Boys Standing By, How Does the Left Step Forward? Views of Police Repression and the Threat of Fascism. A lot of people are out on the streets today, I've noticed. Um, a lot of people are out on the streets cheering because they think they got rid of um, the president. Donald Trump, but that doesn't mean that they got rid of the threat of fascism. And that's what this forum is about. Um, we have advertised three speakers, but actually we are having two speakers today, Gerald Smith and Turha Ak. The people from Greensboro sent their regrets. They were happy to be invited and wanted to participate, but they found themselves too busy today. This event is sponsored by the Oakland Greens, Bay Area System Change, Not Climate Change, and the Alameda County Peace and Freedom Party. And it takes place monthly, the first Saturday of every month. So we hope that you stay tuned. I'm gonna go over the way that you can participate in the forum today. We are gonna have the two speakers for 15 minutes each. Then we're going to have an open question and answer and discussion from participants. If you would like to participate in the discussion after the second speaker, the best way to participate is to go down to the bottom of your screen where you'll see participants. And there's a hand raising feature. Please use that and raise your hand. If you're more comfortable with chat, by the way, you can always use the chat feature and chat to everyone or to particular speakers. Um, if you want to use the chat in order to participate live in the discussion, please type in stack so that we know that you want to be on the stack to participate live. Otherwise, your chats will just remain that as chats. After the discussion, we're going to have a wrap up by the two speakers and people will also be able to make announcements. So those are the rules for the forum and we are going to start with our first speaker, Gerald Smith. Uh, Gerald? Yes. Okay, I'm going to switch to my, I'm gonna share a screen and switch. Oh boy, how did I do that? I'm gonna switch here. Okay, here we go. I'm going to switch to Oh boy. Okay, here we go. And I, excuse me, all right, there is a, there's a view present. Okay, here we go. Uh, this all right terrorism problem has been with us a while. And unfortunately, it is difficult to understand because this is the modern devolution of fascism. It is not quite like the fascism that we have learned about historically. Okay, so this forum is called Proud Boys Standing by How Does the Left Step Forward? Views of Political Repression, of Police Repression, and the Threat of Fascism. What I have to explain here is that uh, the sit let me explain how the situation has changed. In late May and early June of, of uh, 2020, there were two ambush attacks. They occurred against security personnel and law enforcement. Now, what this, and this is in California. So this occurred in Oakland, May 29th, and then in Santa Cruz. And some group it winds up, it's called the Boogaloo Boys, which are a right wing split from the Proud Boys, murdered two policemen. 
there's nothing, the police, while it is true that the cops and the Klan go hand in hand, and historically, sometimes, the cops and the Klan are the same thing. In this particular situation, the cops wanted to resolve this. They wanted to know who was killing these officers. So the attacks left two dead and injured three others. The attacks began, as I said, on, on with the drive-by shooting in front of the court, federal courthouse in Oakland. Now, that situation, there was a federal protective service officer killed, black, black man killed. And understand this, this was done intentionally by the Boogaloo Boys to make it look like a demonstrator had killed the police. So in fact, during the, the, uh, the press conference, the inadequate American media kept asking the police, well, it was a demonstrator to kill him, right? It was a demonstrator to kill him. And the cop, the cop had to say, no, these people came to kill the police because they had been following them now for some time. Okay, so uh, it winds up uh, US Air Force Sergeant Steve Carrillo was arrested soon after the second attack. And this Boogaloo movement, this, this is different and this helps us. You say, how could it help us? Because the cops and the Klan go hand in hand, when we get the crazies killing the cops, that disrupts the unity of the far right and the police. So for instance, if you notice, if you pay attention to what's going on, recently the FBI arrested and, and they have indicted 14 so-called militias in, um, for attempting to kidnap the governor of Michigan and Virginia. Okay, now look, they put four informants in this militia. So they got all the tapes, they know everything. And these cats actually said, if any cops get in the way, kill them. And that's what made the police hurry up. And if they were only killing leftists, the police might have just sat, sat by, sat on their hands, or what have you. So this gives us the opportunity to step back, get ourselves together, figure out what's going on, and organize ourselves. Because there is a temporary disruption of this unity between the fascists and the police because of all of this. OK, so for instance, now just to show you how political intelligence works with the news, KTVU just had a, a, a session where they talked about the murder that occurred on the 29th of this black officer who was, by the way, protecting the Homeland Security location, right? They actually pretended that no, that no one knew who killed this officer. And I, I couldn't believe it. So I went and looked it up. I said, no, I was right. This, I tried to get some news outlets to go after them on this. But you see, this is something that it's no question that they were trying to divert attention away from the fascists and blame the demonstrators, the so-called Black Lives Matter demonstrators for the murder of this pig. And this is after it's already known. It's been on the news. And you have to wonder what KTVU could have been. It's not that I'm a great researcher. It's just that I wanted to, to get it straight. It's amazing how they do this kind of stuff. So what we have here is a question of basically fronts and fakes, the Proud Boys and the Patriotic Prayer. So let's look, what is what am I recommending? 
Okay, let's be clear. I'm not just against the fascists, right? And let's be clear that there is, you cannot be anti-fascist. You have to be for something. And we have an answer. Rosa Luxemburg said it a long time ago. Socialism or barbarism. Fascism represents barbarism and we are for socialism. That is our answer to fascism. Not just to stop fascism to save bourgeois democracy. No, sir. In fact, that's the problem with all of this so-called anti-coup stuff. When you look behind the groups that are organizing this anti-coup stuff, including the trade union bureaucracy, you scratch them and what do you see? A Democrat. Okay, so in, in, in 2017, the group calling itself the Patriotic Prayer uh, said that they were gonna march on San Francisco. We got together and, and, and persuaded the longshoremen to act. The longshoremen proclaimed that they were gonna stop the, the Patriotic Prayer mobilization. Patriotic Prayer didn't even show up after the longshoremen proclaimed they were gonna smash them. They didn't show up. That is the answer. The working class is the answer to all of this. That is why we cannot surrender our proletarian perspective in fighting fascism. Uh, to go on, the so this, um, just to give you, who is it you see these large anti-fascist mobilizations. Number one, in, 19, in 2017, what really happened? What really happened in 2017 was they went after Antifa. I got some background noise and please could we stop that immediately? Yeah, I'm gonna try. I, I, I admitted a phone number and I think I made a mistake. That's okay. We always make mistakes. Just stop Two, it. Two six nine seven zero oh, two two. I'm. Uh, it sounds like it stopped. I got it. Yeah, but you know, a lot of people need to mute themselves. But anyway, look. Here's here's what's important. What's important is this so-called anti-coup movement is not a movement at all, but just you know, Democrats that you know. The fact of the matter is. The bourgeoisie, the capitalists, has come to a consensus that they were through with Trump. And we need to understand that, okay? And that is why they stop funding the fascists. Understand that. How do these guys go all around the country? How do you get Charlotte? How do you get all the fascists that came to the Bay Area? Somebody is buying them tickets. So for instance, it is a known fact that Betty DeVos, gave thousands of dollars to the fascists to mobilize and come to the capital of Michigan in their anti-mass demonstration they had not, you know, not to, it's sick. But that money has dried up because the bourgeoisie, as I said, and I'll say it again, now has the consensus against Trump. There will be no coup, that's fantasy. There will be no coup without what? Number one, we know that the police are against the Bugaloo boys because they're killing them. Two, we know that the FBI is against all of this so-called militant uh, militias because they arrested them. And then we had three, three weeks ago, the so-called Proud Boys were, were gonna come to San Francisco. They didn't even show up. And in fact, their, their front men got their ass whooped and no one no one on our side got arrested. Let's be aware of what- Five minute really warning. Going. I'm sorry? Five minute warning. Okay, so let me, let me just take it, let, let me give you a little background. So the money stops, the fascists stop. There's no coup, there will be no coup. What we need to do is to organize politically independent and stop fronting for these Democrats. It is no secret that fascism uses the state, specifically the repressive forces, that is the police, to their advantage, and why shouldn't they? But why do the capitalists, given all their democratic pretensions, 
play footsie with fascism. The capitalists talk about democracy and use this talk to fool the masses of people. They even talk about so-called human rights. Today, we are witnessing the spectacle of the United States, France, England, threatening you know, to, to, to re-up on imperialism. What hypocrisy. The capitalist system today is dying. That's what we're seeing. And that's why they hold on to these fascists. That's why we call this the, ep the, the epoch of capitalist decay. Many people believe the United States is anti-fascist because we fought the Germans during World War II. Well, unfortunately, as I said, the decline of capitalism continues and they, they scared to death. The historic task of fascism, so what is the fascism? Is to smash an insurgent working class and prevent it from seizing power as the Russian working class did in 1917. But one might ask, if the American working class is not currently insurgent, why would the capitalists need the fascists today? Actually, the American capitalists do not need the fascists at this time, but they know that they may need them in the future. And so they are basically holding them in abeyance so that when the working class begins to rise, they can unleash the dogs of fascism on the rising working class. Looking at the recent teacher strikes, for instance, uh, that occurred in, in West Virginia, Oklahoma, you know, actually shows us that they may need these fascists sooner than we realize. Okay, so just know the perception of fascism is very important. We have to get this right. I believe that, you know, it's, it's, this is sad, but to say this, the FBI recently did a, 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 an investigation into how, and I quote, their investigation was that the fascists have historically engaged in strategic errors to infiltrate and recruit from law enforcement communities. They quietly ended the investigation because they had discovered so many cops that were active fascists. That's what we're facing. So we're getting a little rest right now because of these boogaloo uh, creeps. But eventually, let me tell you, they're gonna return to the cops and the Klan go hand in hand. And we must be ready for that. Today, as I said, fascism has evolved so much that they're willing to use black faces. So when you look at the Proud Boys, they, they try to have a brown skinned Latino as their so-called leader. This is not the traditional fascism that we are accustomed to, but, but don't be fooled. Eventually, they're gonna get right, right back on track and I think we will see that American fascism will be overtly racist. Right now, it's confusing. We have to look at it carefully. We have to study the facts. But really, American fascism is going to be not only racist, but anti-Semitic. And, and, and that, Time I'm is sorry? up now. Say? Time up. Okay, let me finish my sentence. I just think that most recently this has been uh, through, through these organizational cliques and stuff, but I, I, I wanted to share with you and I don't, I can't, I, oh boy, let me just. Yeah, um, this, I'm sorry. This, uh, let's give Gerald five more minutes because our next speaker is not here. Very good, very good. I'll run through this very quickly. Don't think that the Bay Area is not involved. Here, Nia Wilson was murdered in Oakland by John Lee Cowell, 7-22-18, 2018. I'm gonna run very fast through this. Nicholas Cruz, a member of a white supremacist Republic of, of Florida, murdered uh, junior reserve officer training 
core of a black man who was in the army. How about Dylan Roof, the last Rhodesian? And here are the people, here are his victims that led him into their church to worship with him. And he then murdered all nine of them. Okay. Richard Collins III was murdered by white nationalist Sean Urbanski, right? Unprovoked knife attack. Timothy Cogman slain by white nationalist James Jackson. This is recent stuff. In fact, over 500 people have been killed in this fashion by various Nazis and KKK since, since the 1990s. That's a lot of people, y'all. We have to pay attention to this. And of course, this Jeremy Joseph, he's the cat that um, that stabbed the two people, killed the two people on the train in Portland that came to the defense of uh, one woman who had a hijab on, right? I'm, I'm, I have to run through this because really what we, what we want to say is that this anti-labor militia will force the unions to organize for survival. It is a good thing that they felt like coming out today. It is a bad thing that the leadership of the unions today is absolutely committed to the Democrats. And lastly, I'm going to just end with this point. Now is the time to smash them into the earth. As Hitler confessed, only one thing could have broken our movement. If the adversary had understood its principle and from the very first day had smashed with the most extreme brutality, the nucleus of our new movement, now is the time to smash them into the earth because I'm telling you, they are not strong at all. Once the bourgeoisie backed away from them and stopped funding them, we see they call events that they don't even show up to. Uh, Massachusetts, we had 40,000 people, 50 fascists showed up. Come on. So what is the threat? The threat is being confused, not understanding the facts. We. The workers of this world will rise again. Fascism, never. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Gerald. Um, I want to apologize as moderator, I neglected to introduce the person who you were just listening to. This was Gerald Smith, who joined the Peace and Freedom Party in 1984 after it officially adopted socialism Socialism is its goal. He was a Peace and Freedom Party candidate for Congress in 1998 and for state treasurer in 2006. And he also ran for Oakland School Board in 1996, having been recruited by the teachers union in Oakland, which was uh, conducting a strike at the time. And Gerald was a great supporter of that strike. He joined the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1964 and in 1965 worked with the with CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality during the Harlem rent strikes. In 1969, he joined the Black Panther Party just before the COINTELPRO inspired attempted frame up of the New York Panther 21. Gerald then became a scientific socialist and joined several struggling propaganda groups. He's still active today. He's a member of DSA, the Democrat. Hello? Marcia seems to be Depression and no justice under capitalism. Excuse me? You're, you're, you're cutting out, Marcia. Oh, I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> you said something about he joined and then it stopped. Uh, he joined the NAACP. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. He joined the NAACP in 1964. In 1965, worked with CORE during the Harlem rent strikes. In 1969, he joined the Black Panther Party 
and he became a scientific socialist and worked with several groups. And today he's a member of the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, of course, still the Peace and Freedom Party, and a founding member of the Oscar Grant Committee Against Police Brutality and State Repression and No Justice Under Capitalism. So we wanna thank Gerald for his presentation. I'm not seeing if we have our next speaker yet, Turha Ak of uh, Community Ready Corps. If Turha is with us, he should let us know by chat or by somehow. Um, so I'm gonna open this up. Thank you, um, Vicente. I'm gonna open this up for discussion. Um, we can have three minute, um, three minute uh, presentations or questions. And in between, if there are questions for Gerald, I'll give Gerald the forum to answer the questions. So if you wanna participate, either use the hand raising feature under participants or use the chat. And then um, please put stack before you begin to write your chat because then we'll just call on you. Otherwise people will just read your chat. I'm not seeing, um, um, anyone who actually, oh, I see a couple of stacks. Okay. Uh, Zach I'm has gonna, his hand up. I, okay, Zach has his, I'm gonna start with Farah and then Yousef and then Zach. Go ahead, Farah. You need to unmute. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, this is Farah. So, yeah, this is the question I have for Gerald. Um, um, from your perspective, I know you mentioned the Proud Boys trying to have a, a brown face for their movement um, by having a, a brown Latino leader for the Proud Boys. Have you noticed any trends of counter recruitment of black people by fascists along the same lines? Um, why don't we let Gerald answer that quickly? Gerald, unmute yourself. Um, I don't know what happened to Gerald. So let's get um, Yousef and we'll hold that question for Gerald. Go ahead, Yousef. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, uh, recognize the anniversary of the great October first Revolution today. So, um, uh, it, well, I, I, in my view is that there is a genuine uh, a split in the uh, ruling class. Uh, I, I don't think it's uh, imaginary. Uh, I cannot label it uh, imaginary. I think it's legitimate for the working class uh, to manipulate uh, the contradictions within the ruling class to its benefit. Uh, as for fascism, the real fascists are the, uh, are the, uh, are the uh, you know, uh, uh, among the one percent, and it's not unusual. Uh, in fact, it is usual practice when they come to power, they will get rid of the riffraff that uh, 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 they use as support. I mean, they don't forget to burn uh, the, uh, the 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 riffraff uh, SA were uh, among the first. To be eliminated. It's not to bring them into power. It's to, uh, 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 to benefit uh, capitalism. So uh, I think uh, these are some points uh, uh, that one should bear in mind when analyzing the situation. Thank you. So excuse me. Harold, excuse want, me. Go ahead. I just wanted to explain to Brother Farah. I should have stated it, but I didn't. I tried to slip to the bathroom. And then I can't, I heard his question. And anytime the moderator wants me to answer the questions, I will. So it's up to you. Yeah, go ahead. You want to okay. answer? Uh, go oh, ahead. yes, definitely. Farah asks, and Farah, you can jump in here at any moment and just tell me if I got it right. Because this, this is a very, this is a serious problem. This is what's different about the fascists now as they present themselves to the public and what we have known historically about fascism. And that is 
uh, I wish I could show you on screen the people that they that they said were going to be speaking at this event that occurred in San Francisco. And uh, this was about three weeks ago. The Proud Boys said they were coming and oh boy, people got to organizing and we gonna do this and we gonna do that. The Proud Boys, I think it was maybe five Proud Boys max at the event. And this silly uh, Philip, Philip Anderson, the main speaker, he, he's not a Proud Boy. What he, what he is is Blacks for Trump. There are there is an alliance between the right wing of the Republican Party and these fascist organizations. They openly work together. And if this is the gentleman that lost all of his teeth, that apparently slipped and fell on somebody's fist. You know, and that I'm gonna tell you, no, the answer to you, Farah, is no. Black masses, the masses of Black people are not flocking to fascism. This is a, a very small number of Black Republicans. And the reason that number of Black Republicans is growing, also there was, there was a, a group called Blacks for Blumberg. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, Bobby Rush, the former Black Panther that is a congressman in Chicago, was a part of that. So how is this possible? Why are people joining this Blacks for Blumberg and Blacks for Trump? Because there ain't no goddamn difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. As, as Eugene Debs once said, there's not a dime's worth of difference between them. And that is why we have to uphold, support, and build our political independence, and we have to work towards the formation of a mass workers party. That, I believe, is the proper answer. Farad, did I answer your question properly? Uh, yes, you have, Gerald. Um, thank you for that. Um, give me a better perspective. Okay. Okay, this is Marsha, the moderator again. I just want you to know, I see the stack has um, Zach, Gene Rule and Dave Campbell. I want to remind people that you could um, use participants and use the hand raising feature to get on the stack as well as using the chat. I think the hand raising feature is the preferred method, but either way, as long as you type in stack, you would get on. And now we're going to go to Zach. Thank you. So um, that was a great presentation and uh, I think, you know, a great analysis of the, the present situation. So I guess going forward, my question for you is, you know, what do you think is, um, I guess, what do you think is going to come of these fascist groups, which up until recently, we're seeing, you know, an influx in membership and press and stuff like that. So are we going to see these groups go a little bit more underground or will we still see them supporting right wing causes and uh, right wing politicians, maybe not, you know, traditional Republicans, but I guess uh, continuing what they've been doing more than anything, or do you think that their activity is going to, uh, you know, recede? Um, okay, Gerald, can we do like a couple of questions and then go to you? So it's we up have to you. It's up to yeah. you as the moderator. As long as you can keep track of the questions that are being asked, I'm going to try to do this thing of having three people and then have you answer just to give people more chance to participate. So we're going to go to Gene Rule. Well, let me ask you, that was Zach that just spoke? Yes. Okay. I wrote down his question. Let's Great. go. Ahead. Go ahead. And I want to tell Michael, if you want to be, I can't tell if you want to be on the stack or not. So uh, you need to type in stack if you want to be on the stack uh, or raise your hand. Let's go to Gene. Go ahead, Gene. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marcia, and uh, for organizing this. And thank you, Gerald. It's good to see you. I always welcome uh, listening to your uh, comments on this. 
Um, what I, I want to, and I want to remind people that our presidential candidate, uh, Gloria LaRiva, will be speaking tomorrow at the Marxist Library. So um, there's lots to continue to discuss on this issue. But I wanted to, what I was uh, getting, waiting for this to happen, I was glancing through the Communist Manifesto, my Bible, and I came across this phrase that, as we have seen above, the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the working class to the position of ruling class, to win the battle of democracy. And I don't think many of us really think that the victory uh, of Biden is really winning the battle of, or even a step forward in the battle of democracy. And I'm thinking back to when I was in Cuba some time ago at the 100th anniversary of the publication of the Communist Manifesto. And one of our, us North Americans asked our host, how can you talk about democracy in Cuba when you only have one political party? And the response was, under Batista, we had seven political parties and no democracy. Now we have one political party and we have democracy. So I just would like uh, Gerald to comment on that or anyone else. Uh, and I I'm sure we'll get um, Gloria to speak on that tomorrow too. So that's it, thank you. Okay, since we have two complicated questions for uh, Gerald, I'm going to put Gerald back on and then the stack after that will have Dave Campbell, Michael, Michael K and Dave K. Okay, go ahead, Gerald. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Marcia. All right, now, Zach, this is for you. Really, the, so the essence of the question and, and Zach, you can jump in here any minute if I get it wrong, because I want to answer your question, is what next for the fascists? And is the far right on the rise? Well, yes and no, because in some situations, it's it's insane. We've gotten these far right congressmen that have actually gotten elected in Georgia. There is a woman who is a proponent of this QAnon nonsense, who was literally elected to Congress. So there's a couple of actual fascists who have been successfully elected to Congress. This is something to pay attention to. It is not something to be alarmed by. What we, we're gonna continue to see this as long as our brothers and sisters, that is, our, I'm talking about the unions, I'm talking about people that want socialism. We have to leave that stinking corpse, the Democratic Party. We have to leave it. You know, every time I think about that Kamala Harris, I don't think you guys remember, but she made a law that if, if children miss school, you could arrest the parents. And one of the parents, the first parent that she did a big fanfare and press conference when they arrested her was a poor woman whose child had sickle cell anemia. The problem with the woman is that she wasn't responsive. She wasn't writing the school. She didn't have email to tell them, you know, my kid's sick today. The kid just didn't show up. So they made a big deal and arrested this poor woman, but the child was really sick. So they, they wound up pulling back on that. This is the kind of so-called leadership that the Democrats offer. When that is going on, the right is going to get stronger. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. So we we have to. One. Uh, the answer is yes and no. On the one hand, as long as we stay in that identity politics and that Democratic Party bullshit, we cut. We are we are asking for trouble. We have to develop a program that speaks to the felt needs of our brothers and sister workers. Many of them are Trump supporters. We have to win them over to the cause of the working class with a program that speaks to their needs. All they get from Trump is a whole lot of talk and some goddamn Oxycontin. That's what they get. 
we have a program for the redemption of our class and that's what we have to advance. Uh, Zach, did I answer your question? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, I, I agree with something you said earlier about the need for, you know, independent militant organizing um, to, to counter those structures, whether it be, you know, the fascist cadre or, um, you know, the Republican and Democratic parties in general, which are right wing in nature. So, you know, we absolutely need a, you know, a revolutionary party to, uh, to step in and to keep building those organizations wherever we are. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Zach. So we're going to move on to the next um, four. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was supposed to answer. Answer, Gene. Yeah, That's can, right. Can you do that pretty quick? Because we have four people waiting. Thank you. You know, there's some deep love going on here because I was getting ready <laughs> to say something. But uh, look, Gene is absolutely correct that a country like Cuba which has overthrown capitalism. And in spite of all of the American uh, imperialist pressure, the Helms-Burton Act, the, oh, it's just, it's sick what they do to Cuba. I've been to Cuba twice and it, it just, I don't even think about it, seeing how those people suffer because they're not allowed to engage in trade. It's, it's not good, but understand this, Yes, Cuba is more democratic than Honduras, for instance. Of course it is, but we don't know how to measure that. Eventually, uh, when I was last in Cuba, they said they're gonna try to create a parliament. I don't think that's a good idea. I would like to see the reemergence of workers' councils, Soviets, which have multi-party working class tendencies not bourgeois parties. Bourgeois parties should and can be suppressed. That is not democracy when they go around staging provocations and undermining the worker state. But I do think that we need to have multi-party working class organizations because the way that you learn is through criticism. Criticism is not always negative. It can have a positive, if it leads to correcting the error, it can be positive. So in that sense, I am for multi-party workers' councils. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jean. Um, thanks, Gerald. Uh, I'm gonna call on Dave Campbell. He'll be followed by Michael Kay, Dave Kay, and Vicente. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, uh, just, just off the topic of what I was going to say, but uh, tagging on to what Gerald just said, uh, one of the reasons that I like the Peace and Freedom Party is because of its multi-tenancy nature that basically, you know, every socialist, ten if you agree with our basic socialist program that we want the working class to control the means of production and all that, uh, you're in. Um, and as I sometimes say, uh, it's not even uh, it's not even so much about a one party state. I don't even want a one party party. Um, and so that's why I like peace and freedom. But what, back to what uh, Gerald was originally saying in the presentation, um, I, I think that reacting to the fact that the Boogaloo boys in particular uh, have uh, 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 not endeared themselves with the police. Uh, I don't think that uh, is cause for like for us to relax because all sorts of, you know, I mean, the Proud Boys still exist and they're still palling around with the cops. Uh, the Threepers, the 3% militia, quote unquote, and other uh, armed groups like the one in Kenosha uh, are still palling around with the cops. The cops are still well on the side of these armed fascist groups. And they are even now today doing shit. Uh, I don't think it's time, uh, as I said in a Facebook post, uh, this is not the time to lighten up, it's the time to tighten up. Because there's a lot of shit gonna go down in the next couple of months. 
Um, that that's my feeling. And whether or not the capitalists uh, feel they need the fascists at this point, the fascists don't necessarily give a shit. They're going to do what they're going to do, regardless of what their uh, backers or former backers uh, want. Uh, they can do quite a bit of damage unmoored. So I think caution is warranted and preparation as well. Over. Okay, thank you. Um, may, I, may I speak to that? No, we're going to go to the next few speakers because I want to make sure everyone gets in, okay? And then you'll have a chance to respond. But um, sometimes, may I just say this, Comrade Chair? Sometimes a question is a little complex and I'm trying to keep notes. I'm trying to directly answer gotcha. people. Gotcha. And sometimes I'm not now, but you know, when I'm going with you. Thank but you. I just want you to know that sometimes that that question needs to be spoke to at some point. But continue, please. Yes, because I really want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to participate. Yeah, but I want to go be ahead. accurate. Stop it, Gerald, please. We're going to go on to the next person, Michael. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Marsha, and thank you, Gerald. Um, Gerald, you said it was a stinking corpse and there's not a dime's worth of difference. And I know that you firmly believe that. But 74 million people voted for that stinking corpse. So I don't think it's dead. Uh, the overwhelming majority of unions are uh, part of the Democratic Party, so I don't think it's dead. There are actually unions that are part of the Republican Party as well. There's a big struggle starting in the Democratic Party between their centrist wing, led by Biden and Pelosi, and their progressive wing, led by Pramila Jayapal of the Progressive Caucus, and AOC and the Squad. The squad just doubled in size from four to eight socialists now in Congress, all on the Democratic Party line, but that doesn't mean much to me. Uh, the, the centrists in the Democratic Party will be strengthened by these Lincoln Project Never Trumpers. They were Republicans, but now they're being welcomed by the centrists in the Democratic Party. Uh, so the Democratic Party, in my opinion, is not a stinking corpse. It's an arena of struggle. I'm a registered green, but that's just one individual choice. The arena of struggle, in my opinion, right now is the Democratic Party. And I'm wondering what role leftists like me and Gerald and others should play in this very important struggle within the Democratic Party. That's it. Thank you, Marsha. Okay, so Gerald, I will let you speak now. I just want to let you know there are two other people, three other people on the stack after that. And we still haven't heard from our other speaker. So I want to, sometimes I have to- Is the other speaker here? Not yet, but that's okay. why I'm, I'm just organizing this. I want to make sure there's time for everyone. Please allow me to chair. Go ahead, Gerald. Okay. I am going to allow you to chair and I do respect you, but I, I think that Dave Campbell with the stuff about tighten up, I, I agree, Dave. I, I did not say we should lay down and go to sleep. I said that we are disoriented. And I believe that Michael Kaufman's uh, comments demonstrate that's what we need to tighten up with, okay? So what am I saying? I'm saying, yes, politically tighten up. But that first step means that we have to break with the politics of the Democratic Party. The fascists are going to keep on doing what they're doing? No, they're not. No, they're not. Because they're cowards. They're scum. Yes, I said it. And they're not going to place themselves in any real danger. So as soon as the situation gets hot and they, and they start rounding these bastards up, they duck down and stay inside the internet where they belong. They do, they do not openly defy the bourgeoisie. They are the bourgeoisie's helpers. So I think, Dave, we have a, a slight difference over what to expect from these fascists. They're not going to defy anything. They, they work for the bourgeoisie. And I, I don't believe that they have any real political courage. Now, Michael K. That doesn't mean we should go to sleep, but that 
Michael K., who I definitely love and respect, the good brother. I could not disagree with you more, sir. While whether or not the corpse is, is uh, still alive is not really my question. 72 million people can't be wrong. Yes, they can. Yes, they can be wrong. I got some I got some interference here. What's going on? I believe that 72 million people can be delusional because in fact, the Democratic Party corporate core is moving to the right. Look at what they did with Bernie Sanders. That is, it should be clear. They totally disrespected Bernie. They totally uh, rejected the possibility of him becoming the labor secretary or this woman Warren becoming the secretary treasurer. They totally rejected that. Why? Because they don't want a coalition with leftists. Them, they, their idea was to get more Republicans involved. So it is, I believe, with all due respect, it is a delusion. Should we do work inside of the Democratic Party? Maybe, but I would have a different perspective than yourself. My perspective would be to empty them out of proletarians and leftists and to build a workers party that will fight for a workers government. I'm done on that. I hope I answered, you know, I made clear our differences, Mike. All due respect, finish. Okay, thanks. We're gonna go on to Dave Kavlicek. Okay, um, before I get to the question I was going to ask, I wanted to mention on what Gerald said about Cuba. I believe Cuba has had a parliament of some sort all through the revolution. So I'm not sure what Gerald meant by someone saying they were wanting to move towards having a parliament, maybe moving towards having multi allowing multiple parties. Um, but the question I wanted to ask was, there's a difference between right-wing fascist thugs and right-wing thugs. Uh, I mean, usually, you know, analysis and stuff, it has to do with ties to segments of the bourgeoisie and political parties um, and, and, and all that, and, you know, historical analysis, looking at Europe in the 30s and so forth. Um, what reason do we have to believe that the right-wing thugs we're seeing of the Proud Boys, Creeper militias, et cetera, are fascists as a, you know, I'm associated with uh, a segment of the, significant segment of the bourgeoisie, uh, as opposed to just ultra-right-wing thugs, I mean, which are still something that we need to deal with, but presumably not in the same way that we would deal with an actual fascist movement. That's it. Okay, um, I'm going to call in. Uh, oh, somebody. Hmm. Could the person with their hand up who's on the phone let us know who they are? Which means you have to unmute. Hello. Yes. I just yeah, want to. Know... Yeah, this is Rich Johnson. Okay. Uh, and, so, Rich, I'm not uh, going to. Oh, I'm not going to well, call on you yet. I just you needed know, to know I, who you were. Hello, I didn't want to be called on. I wanted to be let in. It, just take my hand down. I'll put it up if I need to talk. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm okay. So I just want to explain to the uh, participants that um, I'm waiting on another speaker. So that's why I'm interrupting to see who people I, who they are, if I don't know who they are. So it, it was Dave Kavlicek, and then I'll call on Vicente, and then I'll call on Gerald again. Go ahead, Vicente. Hey, thanks. Um, uh, I have a question that would be actually to everyone. I would love to hear what people thought, but I also believe in alternative parties, but I also think that we have a lack of critical thinking. It's always been evil, the two-party system. It's always been elitist uh, and classist. The election in 2020, Nebraska just took slavery off of one of the laws as far as using criminals as slaves, actually as slaves. So slavery was never abolished here. And we don't critically think about that um, in the two party system. Nationally, I think I, we may have to stick with it because they've been playing the game too long. So my question is, 
as being alternative parties. And, and remember, there are several already, already, excuse me, Constitution, Libertarian, Peace and Freedom, and Greens. I myself am a registered Green, and I chose that because the Green Party seems to be the most diverse as far as political ideologies. I identify as an anarchist. Uh, I'm a non-monogamous. I'm you know, always on the fringe, but we have a lot of different things inside of the Green Party. I'm glad that we actually took an anti a capitalist stance, but not so much uh, possibly in socialism as other people would think. So right now, all we do is go to rallies and chant. And if all that was working, it would have worked already. So my question to everyone is, would people support using rallies as a way to uh, recruit uh, candidates, people before profit candidates, so that we can actually have, uh, whether it be a city, a local municipal governments, whether it be parks and recs, green sheriffs, everything, that would actually work for the people as opposed to hollering at them. Uh, and it seems like we haven't done that very well. And I also believe that at least for the Green Party, it seems the reason we haven't done it is because of our own internal problems, whether it be sexism, racism, even homophobia. We went from probably the most radical hip hop candidate uh, in uh, Cynthia McKinney and Rosa Clemente. And then we went to Jill Stein, who was a very intelligent person, but was extremely, extremely, and I'm kind of trying to get away from those labels, but for the purpose today, really, really white. Uh, and then uh, the way that Howie got uh, the nomination was kind of shady uh, that people were talking about, and then we don't debate it enough. So again, back to the question, would everyone support using these rallies and really focusing and not tightening up, but shifting into a higher gear of going, you know what, you need to run for office. You need to work on that staff. Anytime you have a thousand people at a rally, I feel like a thousand people is enough to find 14 candidates that's taking over all of your school boards, mayor and city councils and staff them to uh, be able to fight and raise it some sort of money to fight this capitalist system. And, and then I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Gerald. Okay, um, I have to be honest, I am not totally clear on Dave Kavlicek's comments. Um, I do understand that there's a difference between right-wing thugs and fascists, a thin line. So for instance, it was right-wing thugs that sabotaged the vote count in Florida uh, under Bush, Bush Jr. Okay, so there is such a thing as right wing thugs that are somewhat different from fascists, but I'm not clear on what exactly. See, here's the difference. There are right, right wing thugs associated with the Republican Party and there will always be. But, and this is, this is where we need to be clear. Fascism is a mass movement. And that's why I'm trying to tell y'all, it is not at this point, it is not that the fascists have been recruiting large numbers from the masses of people that can go around smashing every strike that takes place, every demonstration that takes place, because that's what eventually happened in Germany the fascists went around marauding and, and actually broke up trade union meetings. They attacked the communist party's office, Liebnick and uh, Luxembourg, that the beautiful office was destroyed and burned by the fascists. We are nowhere near that. That's what point I'm trying to get across. But the path away from that is not through the democratic party. That's what I'm trying to tell y'all. It requires the political independence of the working class because actually we seek to deprive these right-wingers from their working class base. We have more in common with workers who are ignorant and go along with that Trump crap than we do with some of these uh, academic um, ultra leftists, you know, talk a lot. We have a program that speaks to the material interest of working class people, 
regardless of their political affiliation. And that's what socialists need to understand, in my opinion. Now, on Vicente, I'll just say this. Yes, Vicente, obviously, we need to, we need to be at the rallies. And yes, we do need to. Uh, one thing, we definitely got to start turn to the young people. That's why I joined the DSA, to be honest with you. So I could have access to young uh, people that are subjectively revolutionary. And in fact, you should know that I participated in the school board elections. I helped to manage and politically guide more than one um, you know, school board candidate. And we, you know, we did okay. I'll I'll talk about that later. I I probably shouldn't use this time to talk about our work in the school board elections, but the OEA wound up getting three of the four people that they endorsed elected. And I was a small part of that. Marsha, back to you. Okay, so um, I saw that Yousef wants to be on the stack, but I'm gonna call on people who haven't spoken yet. I'm gonna call on Norma next. And I am going to call on myself after that. And if anyone else who hasn't spoken wishes to speak, please let us know. Um, okay, go ahead, Norma. I was just preparing a comment to put on chat so I could be able to read it off and, and have some uh, uh, uni uh, you know, organized presentation of what I'm gonna say. Job is a relation of labor to capital until we can come around to freeing ourselves from thinking we have to use the capitalist structures, the imperialist structures as our guide. We don't have to use them as our guide. We have to use them in order to get along even after we have the revolution. And we can see that going on in places like what the USSR attained in places like Cuba. We still have to use those structures, but we have to condemn those structures. We have to analyze those structures and not let them be our goals. We have to not be out in the streets for the healthcare that the imperialist system requires us to ask for. There's a whole other way to do it. Cuba is exemplifying that to a great degree. The, the, our minds are colonized by this thinking. We have to come loose of it. And I know Gerald freaks when I mention the idea that job is a horrible thing to watch, but it is. It always is abusive to ourselves. Going to school in the morning for, for the children is abusive. Going to the job for the par parents or adults or whoever is abusive. We accept the pain. We, ex we accept the pain and we, we should stop at least verbally accepting the pain. Okay, uh, thank you, Norma. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the Democratic Party and the process, the whole electoral process and what it might have to do with uh, the coming of fascism. So, I mean, the people were just celebrating today that Trump was gone and I've just been really depressed um, I'm not depressed that Trump is gone. I'm really glad that, you know, this uh, outward monster is someone we don't have to listen to any, or we will have to listen to him until we finally get him out by January 20th. But the whole process of the flip between the Democrats and the Republicans has been going on for a long time. It's not a new thing. And we haven't Every time there's a new Democrat, it hasn't gotten to be a more progressive Democrat. It's gotten to be a worse Democrat. And every time that happens, it makes people want something different. But the only thing different that they see is the other party. And that's what and that's kind of the slow, the slow movement towards barbarism that we're getting because we're not building socialism. So how do we build socialism? Um, Yes, I'm for an alternative party, but that seems to be the hard road to go. And I think that that's why a lot of the um, progressive left 
just wants to make the Democratic Party better and go back to some kind of Democratic Party, forgetting that it's the party of people who decimated Native American populations and enslaved people in this country. So, um, so there's, you know, they just think they can't think back past uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, so how do we build that party? Well, locally, yes, I agree with Vicente that we have to get people engaged more, get them to run for office or at least support candidates. And in fact, they do that. And they do that in certain parts of the country. They do that here in the Bay Area. They do that in um, selected niches. But how do we get to the working class all over the country who don't see an alternative? Part of it is that we don't present them with one, but the other part is when we do, we're really mar marginalized. And I, 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 that's what I think is the question that we need to answer here and the one that we're not really addressing. And I don't know how to address it. I hope someone else has some better ideas. Um, so um, I'm gonna call on, uh, I know that Yousef wants to talk. Um, I'm going to call on Gerald and then I'll start a second round unless there are more people that want to get into the first round. Go ahead, Gerald. Yeah, I would like to, uh, to just pass. I, I would agree with what you said. And let's hear from some more people, please. Okay, so go ahead, Yusef. Uh, could you hear me better than last time? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, so. Uh, well, uh, 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 let me uh, go to the point about uh, uh, working class parties. I do not believe, uh, I believe, uh, uh, I, be, uh, I believe in non-sectarianism. I do believe in dialogue among working class uh, uh, cadre Marxist-Leninist parties. Uh, but the eventual goal should be to build one party. That one party should have democratic centralism. Uh, it will be, should be democratic in, in that from a working class uh, viewpoint, uh, there should be <laughs> frank and comradely discussion. But once uh, policy is implemented, uh, you, you stand together. Uh, so uh, I, the Party, the, the socialist countries, there are socialist countries that are parties, but purpose of those parties are to bring into the struggle uh, uh, progressive sectors uh, that are not uh, uh, working class, that have not yet been proletarianized. Uh, so, uh, uh, is, in that sense, that is a, a, a better than integrating them within the uh, communist party. We should remain a country, a party of the working class only. Uh, so I, I, I want, I do agree with many of the things uh, uh, Gerald uh, uh, says in principle. There is a, uh, but there is a genuine um, uh, split in the ruling class. The true fascists are uh, the uh, industrialists who, who, who want to use force and the others uh, who, who uh, at this at, uh, time uh, uh, find it advantageous to use less force. And the, uh, it is perfectly legitimate uh, for uh, uh, the working class to take uh, uh, advantage of uh, splits uh, in the ruling class, but without having a, any illusions about uh, uh, either faction that ultimately uh, uh, there is uh, uh, we, we maintain capitalism and wage war against the working class. So uh, uh, that being said, uh, yeah, I, I would welcome uh, your comments. Sorry, um, I don't see any more people who are asking to speak. Oh, Zach, go ahead, Zach. Oh, I just wanted to say that I, you know, I totally agree with that perspective. Um, and I think it's really one of the great lessons of uh, the Russian Revolution, which, you know, as a couple of people have pointed out, have, uh, you know, celebrates its anniversary today. 
And, you know, of, of course, there's much to be said and to be learned about the mistakes of the Soviet Union, which led to its demise. But I think one of the great lessons is that in order to uh, unite against the, the bourgeoisie, we need to have one strong uh, workers party that's capable of having a united political message, united cadre, uh, and, you know, a truly democratic base in the masses. And I think that if we have a bunch of small parties or smaller parties, then we won't be able to unite against, uh, against the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie and their parties. And we'll really just be playing right into their hand because as we see multi-party democracy serves as a great shell for protecting capitalist uh, regimes that try to mask themselves as socialist countries, uh, such as, you know, many of the, or a few of the Nordic countries. Um, the way Germany has tried, the German Social Democratic Party has tried to position itself throughout history, et cetera. So I think that, uh, you know, that's something that we should really learn from uh, the Russian revolution is how we can defeat an uh, imperialist uh, bourgeoisie. Okay, I see that uh, Jean Rule is on the stack and then I'm gonna call on Gerald again. Oh, okay. Well, you know, thanks again. And um, since I'm on, since we had our first go through, I just wanna say that, you know, I've been involved with peace and freedom as long as most people, I, when I came back to California in the early 80s, uh, after working for um, Barry Commoner, uh, I met C.T. Weber. And so he recruited me and I ran for Congress in 1982. Then when Jesse Jackson came along, that looked very exciting. And it was exciting, uh, but unfortunately it didn't go anywhere. And then I was disillusioned for a while. I toyed with joining the Green Party, but the Long Beach Greens were a bunch of total wackos. And I didn't want to have anything to do with the party that had those people in it. Um, but then I met CT again, and he got me back in, into the Peace and Freedom. And uh, I kind of stayed in there until um, Bernie came along. And Bernie showed a really path that has shown real concrete uh, things. And I just want to say, you know, within Peace and Freedom uh, and the general Greens, and uh, uh, Peace of Freedom Party. Um, uh, and I wanted to say, I really do support very strongly Gloria and uh, Party for Socialism and Liberation. But I just want to say that, you know, there's been a long history of third parties. Uh, I remember there was uh, what they called SCULPT, the Search Committee for United Left Ticket. And then after that, there was a group called uh, the Labor Party. Um, and then there's the Peace and Freedom Alliance. And you, you can't find these people anymore, even in Google. It's hard to find these, these groups. So I just want to say that um, right now, until I still, till see something better come along, I'm going to stick with the squad. Um, but if somebody um, comes along with something better, I either go with uh, um, PSL um, and Gloria, who's going to be speaking tomorrow, but also I think uh, the Communist Party. That's a working class party. It is the party of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. And there's a lot to be said for the fact that they survived this long. So I just wanted to throw out those comments. Uh, and um, I don't know if Gerald wants to respond or we'll fight about this later. So anyway, thank you. Okay, um, Gerald, is it okay if I let... Um... God, come on. I, I, go ahead, go I, ahead. Yeah, I said it's your turn. I got three people I'm trying to respond to. Go for it. Go, I was, okay, Yousef, on the first time you spoke, I'm sorry, I could not even hear you. So I did not, uh, I apologize for not acknowledging you the first time you spoke. But this time I heard you loud and clear. So I want to say one, you know, one party for the working class. Absolutely. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful? Here's the problem. The problem is, and I've been a member of different political parties, 
I was in my youth, I was a, somewhat of a Maoist, Stalinist, and um, I was in the Panthers. The Panthers had its own uh, evolution. And I've been in parties since then. And I want to say that the problem with democratic centralism, democratic centralism, I support it as a means for party functioning. That's great. I think it's a, as Lenin laid it out, it's, it's the way to run a party. That is the majority rules. You do not share your political differences with the public while we are carrying out the program and you maintain your right to criticism inside of the organization. But in fact, most of the groups, I wanna tell you, that shit breaks down real fast, Yousef. I'm, 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 you know, I'm hopeful and I support democratic centralism where it depends on the membership if the membership is clear, principled, and defends it at every step, you can have democratic centralism. But where the membership gets weary, surrenders its political judgment to a clique or cult, democratic centralism can be very, very harmful to that organization. And history is not kind to those who fail to learn this. So, yeah, I'm for, um, you know, I think that's wonderful, but I got to go to Zach. Zach, you know what? And wait a minute, I'm not being cynical. I'm telling you, in the name of, of democratic centralism, we got Pop Paul going on. All right, so we better we better think about this, you know. It's a serious commitment. All right, Zach. So yes, you talking about September 7th, the anniversary of the Russian Revolution. I, I, I applaud that. By the way, December 7th is the birthday of Leon Trotsky. And you know what? December 7th is my birthday. <laughs> so great things happen on December 7th. I, I acknowledge that. But I think you, you need to look again, Zach, at the actual history of the Russian Revolution, because what you will see is that the Soviets in Russia that, that emerged after the February Revolution were multi-party. In fact, the Mensheviks had a majority and the SRs, the Social Revolutionaries, had a majority against the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were the minority. But what happened is as the Bolsheviks were recognized and began to win over the base of the SRs and the Mensheviks to their banner, those parties, that is specifically the Mensheviks and the SRs, went over to the bourgeoisie and actually sided militarily against the worker state. And when that occurred, I think the Bolsheviks did the right thing. At that point, you have to defend yourself. And that means you have to take them on. If you're gonna work with the man, you got to go, period, end of sentence. So just know, Zach, look at it closely. Multi-party democracy is not the problem. The problem is, are the parties in the Soviets or the Workers' Council, just an English translation, are they committed to the continuance of the worker state? If every political party agrees on one thing, we are for workers' power, then we can work out the differences of opinion. But when you start blocking with the Germans and executing Bolsheviks in the Ukraine, when you start working with the British and, and you know, and all kind of, and, and contributing after the Brest-Litev Treaty was signed in um, 
1918, right around March, the, the, the social revolutionaries actually turned on the, the worker state and actually started working with the white guards. Well, I'm sorry, they got to go. So it's not multi-party democracy that was wrong, but particularly the SRs and the Mensheviks who betrayed the socialist revolution in Russia. And finally, for Brother Gene, the reason Gene knows this, and I just want to say, the reason I did not support, Gene taught me a lot. So let me just be really honest. It is Gene Rule that taught me and brought to my attention the significance of Bernie Sanders. I never supported him, nor did I vote for him, but I recognized the importance. So the Oscar Grant Committee, we began to go to anywhere where Bernie was, was doing his rallies in Sacramento, Sonoma County, 30,000 people in Sacramento, 25,000 25, in Sonoma County. We couldn't make the leaflets fast enough. People just came snatching them out of our hands. So yes, we certainly did pay attention to, but here's where I draw the line between myself and the supporters of Bernie Sanders. I do not believe that the Democratic Party can be reformed by leftists and taken over by leftists. The Democratic Party is the party of the bosses. It is their party and you better know it. And if you don't believe it, look at what they did, not just to Bernie, but to the left this time around. They went to the Republicans rather than to cooperate with Bernie Sanders and others, because the bankers decide who is going to be in that government with Biden. I'm going to stop right there. Marsha, it's back to you. Okay, so I'm going to call on um, Steve Willett because he hasn't had a chance to speak. I don't see any other new speakers. Then I'm going to call on Youssef, then I'm going to call on myself, and then Gerald for a wrap up because our time is getting to that time. Okay. Um, Okay, so go ahead, um, Steve. It's only yeah. four o'clock. It's uh, not even. I'm sorry, Norma. We have me other. I ha I'm I sorry. Have, I have the agenda over in front of me. I'm quite aware of the time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I. Uh, I, I just want to throw in my usual uh, speech at this point, and that is, while we talk about the uh, the possibility of third parties and working class parties. We cannot lose sight of the fact that a major impediment to that is the voting system that's used in this country. Mm -hmm. And I feel that this should be front and center in the, in the tasks that we set before us is making changes to that structure. There are very slow but steady changes and progress that have been made. Uh, the city of Albany just in, in, uh, adopted uh, proportional representation, ranked choice voting. It's the only the second city in the country to do that. Cambridge did it in the 40s. Uh, so I just want to remind people that that should be at the front and center of what we're talking about. And the other thing about the Democratic Party, I don't think we can reform the Democratic Party, but it's a hell of a good place to carry out a struggle. Okay, go ahead, Vicente. Are you still there? I, oh, I am. Uh, first, I would like to say I think words matter and then we're, we're at an age now where we uh, are trying to call people their own labels. Uh, that uh, something to put out there for people possibly is to get out of third parties. I think that is a negative word and use alternatives because there's actually three other parties that are national already that just get no play. And I think that's because we haven't focused locally enough. Uh, in response to uh, what Brother was saying about uh, Green Party specifically here in California, boy, do we have a huge, huge ego problem uh, within the party itself here. I think it's also national. I think it also goes to a lot of other political groups. Uh, but speaking as someone, again, as a Green, and I would like to uh, change that, would love to see it grow. And again, focusing on locally, but we do have like a huge ego problem. It happens at all of the 
the meetings and too many people uh, have their own, I don't know, we're all insecure. And I say that too, because even coming from uh, my own ego uh, driven is that I think that the idea again for finding candidates who would run. And listen, if we were, had been doing it right, we wouldn't be here, right? 2020, we still have laws that just uh, are about to abolish slavery in a state. We have uh, had the closest thing to out and out uh, Nazi as fascism. Uh, and I mean, there are actual swastikas in the streets. And when like Gerald was talking the Boogaloo Boys, these are actual anti-Semitic, racist, sexist, homophobic organizations. And we're still fucking going to Starbucks. What in the world are we talking about? So I think again, look, and looking at rallies for the people who aren't the, the leaders, right? I don't want someone who wants to be a leader, right? Who is out there again in their career politicians or, or in their own, uh, agenda trying to uh, navigate this capitalist system by using it as a nonprofit or anything. No, you want to have conversations with people who have unique political minds, and uh, those are the ones you want to convince. And again, going back to ego, and again, not just walking it, I have actually gotten two people now who are about to run. Uh, we're talking about 2024, uh, not necessarily here. One is a friend of my daughter who's in Colorado, uh, depending on where she lives. So, you know, again, I'm also walking that, and I really think that could be possible. Um, and lastly, if we really want to also expand this movement and get the young people and figure out how, I think we need to listen more than we need to talk. I think that is something that I have heard from young people a lot. Like we come and like, hey, would you do this for us? As opposed to how do we support you? Thanks. Okay, I, I'm next and I'm also gonna call on Dave Campbell and then um, Gerald will have a wrap up because uh, we do have enough time for for that. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna thank Steve Willett for getting to some of those mechanics. I was thinking along those lines. Um, so, you know, people wear buttons. Maybe I, it's getting to be Halloween and we have a button that says scare the rich. Um, and I like that button, but I don't want us to scare the working class. And there's a big difference. So we have to be cognizant when we want to organize a party that we organize a party that people want to join. Um, so that people want to join a party that meet that that talks about fulfilling their needs and whether or not they're aware of it under the, um, at first, I think we need a party where people feel like they have some power in the party, where they have some way of participating, of having a voice and then getting control. Because I think one of the big problems we have is that people don't look towards a savior rather than looking towards having collective control over the system, which is what we really want. I, I also think the only way um, it's real, I totally get what Steve was saying that um, we have a two party system here and we've got to break out of that and we've got to somehow get proportional rep representation to get some voice in the system and to be able to organize in the system. One of the real, to me, one of the big losses in this election, um, the big loss is not just that we have a, uh, <laughs> well, it's part of it that we have a, a, we'll have a new president, which is just gonna put us back on the road towards getting the same kind of system again. But we, it, the, thir the, the alternative parties pretty much got smashed in this election. And this has been going on. It gets worse and worse every election where people are told not to pay any attention to the third parties and the third parties are somehow to blame when it's the capitalism and the system that's to blame. So yes, we need proportional representation. At the same time, that's not a resonant demand for the majority of people in this country. We've got to somehow, we've got to organize for it, but we've also got to organize people around what they see as their self-interest and their class demands. And I, I'm really, um, I'm just hoping we can find a way to address that. And now I'm gonna call on Dave Campbell. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a duopoly and uh, the way the American political system is set up, 
there is in fact no room for a third party. But people don't realize why that is. Everybody's focused on the presidential race and on executive office and looking for a, a transferable vote to solve that problem. But a duopoly is formed through the executive branch by first past the post single member districts. That's where the duopoly is generated because it forces the same uh, lesser evil math in the legislative branch as in the executive branch, where you have to decide uh, whether to pick a uh, what you really want, but you're told is not viable, or something that you don't really want, but the other choice is so much worse that you need to go with the suboptimal in order to not have the worst. But that is not really the situation that exists and hasn't been for a very long time. Most districts, most, almost all districts have no second party. They're one party districts. There were 16 seats in the California legislature this past spring where there was literally nobody but the incumbent. Anybody could have walked in to the uh, county registrar of voters, taken out papers, got 20 signatures, and been guaranteed a spot on the November ballot and a second place finish. All that was missing was the people to do that. Now, that's just those seats. There's a whole lot more where the opposition is basically third parties, people like us, people who don't count. What's missing is the organization that can actually fill that void. Unfortunately, the organization that can do that is stuck doing their thing inside the Democratic Party because after 50 years, they still think they can take it over. That's the project. That's the missing piece, right? We've got this puzzle. Peace and freedom is one piece. It's like the structure, it's the, 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 the template. But the thing that the membership organization that can fill that and make it do the things that we're built to do is over there doing their thing with the Democrats. And all they see is the Democrats are viable and you aren't and so we're in the Democrats they're the ones who are making the Democrats viable at this point. If they left the Democrats, there'd be nothing left but their money and bad ideas. So what we need to do is stop talking about building a third party and start talking about building a second party and maybe educate people on the fact that when they feel like they need to vote for the Democrat in their district or uh, uh, because... Uh, uh, Three minutes is up. Oh. Um, you want to finish your sentence? Yeah, finish, let him finish. Finish just, your sentence. Just last sentence. As long as you work inside the Democratic Party, all your victories belong to them. Yes. You only eat the costs. They get the credit, you get the blame. And they will always control the agenda because it's their party and you will never get close to the levers of power. Over. Okay, Gerald. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, so, Gerald, you have your wrap up now. Okay. I wanted to just say that, look, the main point that I think we need to, I, I agree with Dave, what Dave just said. And I'm so, I, I'm glad he said it because I don't have to repeat it. But I do want to say this this is how craven these uh, so called socialists that are in the Democratic Party actually are and I and I you got to look at it Biden actually said that if Medicare for all came across his desk he would veto it and we're talking this is a, a pandemic I know people that literally cannot get sick because if they got sick it costs uh, the rough the rough costs of uh, going to the hospital for coronavirus is roughly averaging $13,000 per day. So if they got sick and was in the hospital 10 days, they would lose their home. 
that's pretty serious. I under, I sympathize with those workers. Uh, Biden, by, by the way, I used to talk about crime bill Clinton. It actually is Biden that actually wrote the crime bill. Yes, Biden, your president. Also, not only that, working, uh, he, has, he has worked to undermine and destroy social security. And when he got caught, Bernie caught him. He lied about it publicly. That was in the debate just happened this year. A liar, okay? I think uh, the law enforcement officer's bill of rights, guess who that is? Biden. Biden helped different police unions walk the law enforcement officer's bill of rights through the various state legislatures to the point that it's law in 26 states of the United States needs to be banned. Uh, I mean, I can go, what are you gonna say? Biden is, he's gonna give a speech when he gets uh, on the 20th. My fellow Americans, now that you've elected me, I promise you nothing. And now that you dumb some bitches done elected me, that's just what you're gonna get. What are you talking about? The Democratic Party? That's the Democratic Party. And I, is any worker really, any conscious worker want this treat? To ask the question is to answer it. No, we don't want it. And finally, I just want to end with this. And that is, uh, I love, Langston Hughes, so I'm going to I'm going to end with a little Langston Hughes, uh, one of my favorite poets. So I can't do the entire poem; time doesn't permit. But I'll do the last three standards stanzas of the same. Langston Hughes wrote this was around 1930. He wrote this poem. Better that my blood makes one with the blood of all of the struggling workers of the world till every land is free of dollar robbers, pound robbers, frank robbers, pasetta robbers, lire robbers, life robbers. Until the red armies of the international proletariat, their faces black, white, olive, yellow, and brown unite to raise the blood red flag that never will come down. Workers of the world will rise again. Fascism never. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, Gerald. Um, so now we have a time when we can have announcements or um, I think that's it. <laughs> um, I think that we've had, um, I'm sorry that we didn't have all of our speakers today, but we had a really great discussion and we had a, one excellent speaker. So thank you, Gerald. Um, so if you want to make an announcement, um, raise your hand would be the best way in participants. Otherwise, uh, I'm, I hope my chat monitors are telling me if there's someone in chat. Um, I see that Youssef raised his hand. Go ahead, Youssef. Oh, I just, I, just I, I wanted to leave y'all. Somebody made me a cake and I want to get on over there. They, they said they were, we were going to get together at four, but I hope I've you know done my duty. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Joe. Go ahead, Youssef. Uh, the uh, uh, the Marxist Library had an excellent speaker last week, uh, Wedi Halevi, on the uh, uh, fall of the Soviet Union. If you have had participated, please uh, uh, listen to it, uh, 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 watch it uh, uh, online. Uh, uh, there's a link. Uh, a, a link has come to me. Uh, and maybe uh, uh, the uh, Eugene could uh, uh, elaborate uh, on, uh, on that. Uh, it, 
the speaker raises very interesting points and it's really worth listening to. Okay, uh, anyone else? Thank you very much, Yusef. Anyone else want to make an announcement? Yes, could Jean jump in? Yes, Jean. Yes, uh, both both um, Wadi's uh, talk yesterday, uh, last week has been posted and you can see that, that the link on our website, icssmarks.org. Um, and go, the link to past programs, if you go there, you'll see, see the link to the recording on uh, what happened in 1917 and afterwards in the Soviet Union. And then Gloria's talk will be tomorrow morning, 1030, and you can find the link at the same place, icssmarks.org, link to current programs. And I'll put both of those, I think, or I'll put the link to the web page into the chat, icssmarks.org. So, okay. So I, I'm through and thank you again. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Marcia and Gerald and everyone. Okay, um, Vicente, you have an announcement? I do, I actually have a couple. So this uh, Sunday also uh, five is Green Sunday uh, for the Alameda County Green Party. Uh, they're doing their post uh, election talk uh, sort of along the same lines here. I will post uh, the link inside the chat. And then uh, the Oakland Greens, um, have their general meeting, which is the third Sunday of every month at uh, 6.30 in the evening. But really the biggest event is starting at the last Sunday, uh, starting in January, where we will, Oakland Greens will begin their virtual town hall series. Uh, they've been getting very, very popular. It's now the substitute to our free movie and a discussion series. These are donation-based events, but always no one's ever turned away for lack of funds. So these are free events. And again, it's just like this town halls where you're really talking and we're listening to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tova. Hi, sorry for joining late. I was in San Francisco at the um, uh, rally there. But anyways, uh, I do have an announcement. Uh, tomorrow, uh, there's gonna be a demonstration at San Quentin. Uh, called by Sisters with Voices, uh, entitled Releases Not Transfers Rally, uh, where they're demanding that they actually release the people that were meant, the judges mandated uh, the state to release uh, rather than transfer them to other um, prisons and, and just move COVID around from place to place. But anyways, it's uh, starting at noon tomorrow. Their, their directions are to take exit to uh, for San Quentin off of 580 East, and it's the first exit after the Richmond Bridge, parked in the lot of the pier to the right. And that's their directions for uh, how to get there, but it's at noon tomorrow uh, at San Quentin. Okay, uh, Dave Campbell has an announcement. Uh, yeah, uh, just FYI, um, uh, uh, just like last uh, month's forum, uh, this one uh, is going to be posted on the Peace and Freedom Party's YouTube uh, channel. And uh, just like in the last one, uh, if you have links to share to the general public, uh, put them in the chat here, and I will include them in the description box on the YouTube post. So there you go. Okay, I want to remind, thank you, Dave, and I want to remind everyone that this is a monthly forum. The next one will be Saturday, December 5th, and it will be a, also, I think, some type of election analysis, but we'll be announcing that um, again. I, Norma had her hand up. Is this, uh, you have an announcement, Norma? You change your mind? Dave just said it. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, Stan has an announcement. Yes, hi, I had to unmute. Uh, I don't have all the information yet, but I can post it on the Peace and Freedom Party website when I do. But as we all know, the state propositions turn out uh, results were a big disappointment to a lot of us. Uh, we lost 22, unfortunately passed, 21, 16, 15, 
23 all unfortunately failed. And there's going to be a Zoom discussion with representatives of the organizers of the various propositions about what happened. And it's billed to be a frank discussion. I think that might be pretty interesting. So when I have the information, the Zoom links and all that, I'll put it up on the Peace and Freedom Party list because, you know, it's really too bad that, and we understand why they spent almost $200 million, why the, uh, you know, the uh, Lyft and Uber workers also, you know, lost a lot of rights. And also in 21, why renters statewide lost rights and, of course, 16 and 15 and so on. So if you want to participate in what could be a pretty decent statewide discussion, uh, check out the Peace and Freedom Party website in about two days. It's going to be later next week, latter part of next week. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so that that occurred to me too that the um, that we lost a lot in the statewide election on the propositions. But I do want to thank everyone for this discussion for joining us. It was a good, lively discussion. Um, oh, I can I ask a question for a second? Uh, well, maybe yeah, we have. Minute. Go ahead. A quick answer. Uh, what happened with the Senate so far, the United States Senate? Oh, that's not, a, does someone want to? Um, well, it's still 48-48, still so not much, Thank you. Not Thank much you. movement. It's, it's going to yeah. depend on the Georgia runoffs in January, two runoffs in Georgia. Thank you. Okay, so I again, I'll thank everyone and um, I, Normally we end peace and freedom meetings with singing the international, but I'm going to spare you, spare you my singing the international now, right now. Um, sing it to yourself, and um, we'll see you next month or sooner. Bye. Thank you.